Und wir sprechen jetzt nochmals über Cybersecurity in a fast changing world. Und zwar geht es jetzt um Benutzerauthentisierung. Da muss man ja den Hackern immer einen Schritt voraus sein. Man kann nicht mit dem Denken von heute die Herausforderungen von morgen lösen. Und das ist das Stichwort für unsere nächste Referentin, Sandra Tobler. Sie ist Mitgründerin und CEO von Futurai Technologies. Sie gründete diese Firma zusammen mit zwei Doktoranden der System Security Group der ETH. Und zwar mit dem Ziel, die nächste Generation der Benutzerauthentisierung für Web Applikationen zu entwickeln, darunter natürlich auch für die Finanz- und die Versicherungsbranche. Wir begrüßen Sie ganz herzlich bei uns, Sandra Tobler. Good afternoon, my name is Sandra Tobler, Co-Founder and CEO of Future So. We heard it, digitalization is everywhere. Data generation is increasing, accelerating every single day. Um, to, to this, of course, also cyber regimes need to put into place that can keep up with this uh, changing framework. So IT solutions today need to make it as expensive as possible for hackers to get access to data of companies. There is a new generation of cybersecurity companies that is actually able to react in a more agile and faster way to these changing threat models. And I am happy to present today a bit about my company, Futuray. We're addressing the problem of data theft um, with so-called two-factor authentication. But before I start to explain a bit more what we're doing, I would like to say a few words about a few myths in cybersecurity, I actually come across quite often these days. Um, so these are perceptions that are very dominant still in organizations. Myth number one, cloud is not secure. So systems and data on cloud are as secure as you make them. Um, let me be clear, cloud can actually be a lot more secure than on-premise installations. Um, this is really something that is more on a political level um, if companies decide to keep on-premise installations. Let me give you an example. Uh, this was um, the latest Spectre and Meltdown um, exploits that was uh, communicated beginning of this year. To give you an idea, the international cloud providers, it took them around one to two days to address the patches and to fix the problem. A local cloud providers took around five days maximum, which is a very good uh, reaction time. But now let's think about servers, local, inf local installations. Have they already done the patches? Have they addressed these? I'm not so overly confident about that. Number two, myth number two, mobile is not secure. I see a lot of companies that uh, still have the really big fear that employees or end customers have uh, entry point into sensitive data. Um, that's how they do, what they do is actually limitate functionalities that are accessible on the mobile phone. Think of mobile banking that has only a number of functionalities uh, compared to the web one. So, also here an, an example that this myth has not really a root in reality. If we look at last year's numbers uh, of iOS devices, it was 0.4% of iOS devices that have been jailbroken. Uh, in comparison, um, Android apps were 0.71% that have been affected with a potentially malicious application. Um, on the other side, uh, when you look at user computers, 29% of users computer, user computers, which includes desktop and laptops, have been affected by a malicious um, bit. So um, in a nutshell, there is no evidence actually today that a mobile functionalities should be limited. Um, of course, mobile attacks will increase over time, but again, um, that should not impact what the functionalities uh, that we provided over mobile phone effects. Myth number three, we can do it ourselves. 
So we in authentication uh, face a lot of companies that actually try to build their own authentication infrastructure. You won't fiddle with electrical installation yourself. You have specialists that you ask to come and support you with these activities. The same accounts for firewalls, for mal malware detection, or for spam filters. So why everyone thinks they can build their own authentication infrastructure? Um, it is not a trivial IT task. It's not so much about the design, implementation, the processes, or the testing around it. Like, the problem lies deeper. It's like, it's a changing threat model. I mean, there are different technologies appearing constantly. And how can you m make sure you keep updates um, on a timely manner? So it's a very um, complex task. And um, I would always push for strong um, support that you would consult organizations and experts that can help you build this infrastructure that is, again, uh, in an adaptive way addressing changing cyber threats. Last myth I want to quickly talk about is um, data leakages. It was only publicly available data, not so important data. So there is this very famous quote from the FBI director saying that um, there are only two types of companies, the ones that have been hacked and the ones that will be hacked. Um, there are cynics, actually, that say um, there are only the companies that know that they have been hacked and the ones that don't know that they have been hacked. So um, in the press, we keep hearing still data leakages addressed in a way saying, yeah, but the data was not really so important it was leaked if they, if they have, have to communicate it, or yeah, it was already publicly available data. So let me be very clear. All data that is leaked is important because it has a value for the hacker. It can generate revenue for the hacker. So it is not the standalone data set that really makes the difference uh, or makes it as uh, the big problem. It's really the context you can create with the data set uh, in relation to other data sets. And um, there is no excuse for leaking sensitive user data in today's world. This brings me to the core of what I'm doing and taking care of on a daily basis, which is data theft. Um, 95 passwords are stolen every single second. This is um, due to the fact that we saw it before from Karen. Uh, users use extremely simple passwords, reuse the same passwords for different applications. Um, of course, regulators, they push more and more for stronger authentication, also in different regulatory bodies and in different industries. Um, and it is said, actually, recent reports from last year say that 80% of all the data breaches could be avoided with so-called strong authentication. Now, the big problem in the industry today is still that you have a user impact. So usability is not fully addressed. Think of hardware tokens you use on a daily basis or, or cards to authenticate into your laptops. So now, there are a few technologies that try to address the usability problem. Um, however, there are still a few limitations. Um, if you think of retina authentication or um, ear iris um, authentication, what they require is a heavy investment on sensors. So this is not really a usable solution or technology for mass deployment of end-user authentication. Um, same goes with voice recognition. Today, with artificial intelligence, you can basically train any voice to be copied and repeated. So it does not really work. And do you really want to your customers to talk to your mobile app in public? It's a bit sensitive. Um, if you think of behavioral topics, that could be eventually interesting. Um, so where you, f through your typing behavior or walking behavior, uh, can authenticate securely. Um, today, at this stage, we still see in research some flaws. You need to train the system repeatedly uh, in order to have accuracy, and this is um, prone to mistakes and problems. Um, when it comes to fingerprint or face facial IDs, um, this is something we offer actually as part of our authentication portfolio on the mobile device. However, if it comes to web authentication for e-banking or, or customer portals, do you really want to sa store safely somewhere centrally biometrical data 
Um, so this problem of revocability is not fully solved. Um, there are some attempts, but um, it is not recommended at this stage. Um, so what do we do concretely to kind of resolve this dilemma of usability and security? Um, we offer a comprehensive portfolio of authentication solutions um, that are zero touch, like no interaction, or one touch, uh, for any type of device, from mobile phone, test, desktop, tablet, uh, smartwatch, or conversational interfaces. So, um, of course, you want to see how it works concretely. So I have here prepared a little demo where you see an e-banking platform that has enabled our so-called sound token soundproof. And um, you have a mobile app or an SDK running on the mobile phone. And what happens is the user is entering his first level of security, which is username and password. And then the second factor is kicking in the very moment when you press the button. You keep your phone in the pocket, you keep your phone in the bag, and you're securely authenticated. So it's really invisible security. You don't have to do anything for the user. Um, and you think, yeah, yeah, it looks kind of fancy, but is this secure? Um, again, we come from the system security group, VTH Zurich, so um, our customers do penetration testing with us. And uh, of course, we have the best practices when it comes to um, security. <coughs> so um, apart from this sound token that we offer, we also have a compelling portfolio for um, technologies that allow transaction signing uh, with a push of a button. Um, in the end, it's really zero touch or one touch, also mobile only as a technology, um, offering all types of flexibility for organizations. Um, today's customers are mo mostly in financial and insurance industry. Um, here are a few examples. We, for instance, authenticate securely board of directors of Fortune 500 companies uh, that have to access um, sensitive board meeting documentation uh, with our sound token. Uh, in addition, we have a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform to use our technology, and also our host of today, M6, is using our technology for authenticating the security services, SWS, uh, where users will soon be able to authenticate and uh, through that authentication have higher usability uh, while not jeopardizing on security. So um, I'm very much in favor for ecosystems and collaborations, as my previous two colleagues have mentioned in their talks. Um, in that context, I would highly like to uh, recommend one initiative. We come out of ETH Zurich, of the System Security Group. There is a public-private partnership, so-called CISC, Zurich Information Security Center, that is actually allowing private and public organizations to address their cybersecurity problems, and researchers will work on them to try to fix or um, solve the challenges. So um, again, um, what I have tried to uh, convey throughout my message is bring on board partners, bring on board players of all sizes. Um, big names are not, not only needed. I mean, it should be a variety of expertise um, brought on board um, in order to have this adaptive defense regime in cybersecurity. In a nutshell, um, cybersecurity is a moving target, as I have tried to describe, um, and static software products, as they have been used in the past, are not the solution anymore um, to address them properly. So we at FutureWay, we really try to innovate constantly with our new technologies we bring on board that we integrate quickly into our API that our customers can benefit from them, and um, also with a changing device landscape. So think of the future. Um, today, we have web applications we authenticate mostly, but in the future, it will be your fridge maybe generating data. It will be your clothes generating data. So what we want to do is we authenticate any type of um, authentication that requires access to sensitive data or if you want to execute an operation um, on any type of, let's call it, device at this stage. So cybersecurity. Um, it's crucial, time matters. Time is kind of key these days. And also like this mm, thinking, more adaptive thinking. So after the implementation is before the implementation, it's a constant process that needs to be put in place. 
So with that, um, yeah, my last few words, um, given the threats that reach your organization are changing so rapidly, again, make it as expensive as possible for attackers to get access to your company. Um, try to think in these terms. Um, we at Future Ray, we are a small player in the space, but we have the best of breach uh, cybersecurity researchers on board, um, connection to ETH and its international research network and industry network. And um, again, we're Swiss based, we're fast in adoption of new technologies. And maybe on a pff, on the personal note, we're currently fundraising. So um, <laughs> uh, with this, I would like to close and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think the audience got the message. Um, a, a question, Sandra. I, will it come to the point that also me as an individual um, private person needs to have a, another uh, uh, authenticierungs um, uh, possibilities like a, a double and with the voice and so, or, or does it, um, will that only be for companies? I mean, you have a lot of services you use on a daily basis, mm -hmm. Gmail account, Dropbox, um, even Instagram has now uh, two-factor authentication. So it is not such a big effort to enable it for you personally on use. And given all these hacks of Gmail accounts and whatnot, I mean, that's really a very effective mm -hmm. prevention of those for your personal use. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Yeah.